Amazing. All right. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to see all of you. I'm Jansen Wu, Executive Director of GLAD, GLBTQ Legal Advocates and Defenders. Next Friday, June 26th, we will celebrate the fifth anniversary of the historic <laughs> Obergefell Supreme Court decision that brought marriage equality to the entire nation. And I, it feels so long ago, and yet at the same time, my memories of being in the court, both to hear GLAD's Civil Rights Project Attorney Director Mary Bonato argue in front of the U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of all same-sex couples' constitutional right to marry across the nation, and then my memory of being in the courtroom again with Mary for that day on June 26th and hearing Justice Kennedy read his decision from the bench um, will be forever etched in my memory. Um, and I remember most specifically the very first words that Justice Kennedy read from his decision, which is that the Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach. And what a wonderful week of victories to illustrate the importance that we, that the importance that we continuously fight to include more and more people and ensure that more and more people are included within liberty's reach. With last Monday's uh, historic decision on behalf of LGBTQ workers' rights to be protected from employment discrimination, and then today, just a few hours ago, with the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court to reverse the Trump administration's decision to repeal DACA. It is an important reminder about why the law matters, why the courts matters, and why GLAD's works matter. So thank you for all of you for supporting our work. And here with me to talk about the impact of that ruling, of the Obergefell ruling, um, and some important developments um, that have followed it is GLAD's Civil Rights Project Director, Mary Bonato. Um, but before we get started, a little housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, so if you do not want your face recorded, you can turn off your video by selecting Stop Video at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'd love to know who you are, though, so if you haven't done so yet, please add your name by clicking on the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of your frame and select Rename. We will be taking questions and comments in the chat box throughout, so you can select that at the bottom of your window and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as time allows. Otherwise, we will be muting everyone except the speakers today to ensure good audio <coughs> quality. Closed captioning should appear on the bottom of your screen, but if you'd also like to use your iPhone, or your iPhone or iPad, there's a link in the chat box. And finally, I want to give a special thanks to our GLAD supporters who make our work possible, especially our Equal Justice Council leadership donors. If you are interested in supporting GLAD's critical work, I welcome you to visit us on our website at www.glad.org. You can sign up for our email list there and also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So let's get started. Mary, obviously, Obergefell was a hugely important ruling for our community and one that was decades in the making. Absolutely true. Decades in the making, it's as everyone on this call knows, has been quite a journey. Um, I believe that journey continues. Um, and all of you own a piece of it. Um, you have to remember, and thinking about the length of this journey, that one of the things that happened in Obergefell was that there was a reversal of a previous Supreme Court decision um, in which the Supreme Court had just summarily dismissed an appeal from two men who had wanted to marry in Minnesota and had been rebuffed by the state courts. And the reason the court dismissed the case was because they did not even see, as they put it, a federal question presented in the case. So even though Loving versus Virginia, establishing clearly a fundamental right to marry for all Americans had been decided just a few years ago, the court could not understand the connection between that decision and two men who also sought that same freedom to marry. So it's been a journey, but of course it also predates even those individuals. There have always been people who have wanted to join in that, you know, particular institution and commitment of marriage. Now, I just have to say, like, I never, I always think about marriage and I think about just how many people, institutions, plaintiffs, plaintiffs, you know, have participated in this. And I just always want to say thank you because this was really a movement 
decades in the making, but that really took off. Um, and it only really succeeded because you had parents and grandparents talking about their kids and grandkids, and you had coworkers sticking up for each other and saying, why shouldn't this, you know, why shouldn't my colleague have the same protections that I do? You had major institutions like the military and big and small business and labor all saying, like, this would actually make things a lot simpler for our employees who want to do this. People of faith deeply engaged in this um, discussion on both sides, but also for sure seeing that all LGBTQ people, um, at least in the views of many, are, you know, created in their God's image. Um, just so many people who enriched this discussion and debate along the way. And so I just want to say we can never forget what it took to get there and how important it is to, to keep focused on all of the great things that were revealed in the course of the litigation and the legislation and so on that it took to get there because this was definitely a mighty hurdle. Um, so, yes, and I want to say something about the decision just to remind everybody about it because in some quarters it remains very contested and – you know, this is a decision that reaffirmed that marriage is something that's of fundamental importance for all individuals. And you can't say, but not the ones who are wanting to marry somebody of the same sex, not the LGBTQ ones. Can't say that. When we have a fundamental protection in this nation, it applies to everybody, including LGBTQ people. So in this opinion, as you know, Justice Kennedy ruled in part on the liberty, fundamental right to marry piece of this, but really enhanced the jurisprudence by talking about why the right to marry is protected under the Constitution and how those same reasons compel the inclusion of same-sex couples. And those reasons had to do briefly with, number one, the autonomy of every individual to make this momentous life decision. It's a decision that belongs with the individual and not with the state. Uh, secondly, that marriage is also related um, in intimate ways to decisions around child rearing, child education, having children at all, and that that connection is also applicable in the case of same-sex couples. Um, the court talked about the support of a two-person union and the instability that is effectively imposed on people, something that the court noted that different sex couples would not be able to tolerate if it were imposed on them by and large, um, to just be consigned to the outside of the protections that society makes available to married couples and people who make that commitment. And then finally talked about how marriage is a keystone of society in the sense that marriage has become over time in the last few hundred years in this nation as a civil matter, it has become an enormous edifice for the state to allocate responsibilities and protections to married people and sometimes to their children. Um, and the court referred to that as the constellation of benefits and responsibilities that are linked to marriage. But it didn't stop there in explaining the due process, liberty, peace. It also went on to equality and said that denying marriage abridged central precepts of equality. And the court's reasoning was really rooted in the reality of what it looks like to tell this one group of people alone among all the qualified people to marry that it's only you who cannot marry and talked about how excluding same-sex couples from marriage disrespects and subordinates us works of grave and continuing harm by excluding us from all of these protections and the ability to make this commitment and teaches others that we are inferior. And both of these are important pieces going forward. Thank you for um, really reminding us about how well Justice Kennedy's opinion brought together so many pieces of legal arguments that we as advocates have been pushing forward in the courts for so many years. And it also reminds me of the dissents um, from both Roberts and Alito, but particularly Roberts, um, that, you know, you remember hearing him read that dissent from the court, which is not typical, um, only when justices feel really strongly and, um, and telling us not to celebrate the Constitution because that the Obergefell decision had nothing to do with the Constitution. Um, I'm going to, I want to come back a little bit more to kind of uh, those dissents and kind of the, the, um, the pathway that they've kind of opened up for uh, legal assaults on the Obergefell decision. Uh, but for a second, I'd love for you to kind of switch gears and talk about kind of the changing cultural understanding of, of who we are as couples and families. And um, obviously it was a sea change that was brought on by 
all of the many people and institutions that you mentioned earlier, including, um, you know, deep appreciation for the many plaintiffs who served in Glass cases. Um, but from your perspective, w- would you say that marriage equality is a settled matter now when it comes to cultural understanding and public acceptance? I want to say yes, and I, I'm concerned about being too confident just because the lessons of history are that uh, things can change. Um, so on the one hand, I think it's clear, and there is data um, about how marriage has certainly become more accepted. And as Chief Justice Margaret Marshall um, from the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, you know, reminds us, marriage is happy, people clap, you know, hooray, good for them. And it's hard to disagree with happiness. It's hard to disagree with people making a commitment and taking responsibility for one another. So all of those things I think have helped and the ability of people to be more out um, and to be more honest about who their families are and hopefully less, a little less fearful, at least in some places of discrimination, has made a difference in getting to know who LGBTQ people are. So married or not, and so that has certainly made a difference. Um, I also just want to say that the Public Religion Research Institute, PRRI, um, earlier this year released their, um, their most recent survey of attitudes on these issues. They've been tracking them since 2007. And we now have 62% of Americans in favor of marriage and 33% opposed. Um, that's up 10 points from Obergefell when it was basically 53, nine points. Um, and there's been a decrease in strong opposition and an increase in strong support. Um, and among younger Americans aged 18 to 29, the numbers are pretty dramatic, three quarters support, a quarter oppose. If you start breaking this down into other particular demographics, what you'll see is that every demographic group has been moving toward more support. Um, some don't reach majority support, but every, everyone is moving closer. So if you take, for example, white evangelical Protestants, 41% support. Um, Hispanic Protestants, 47% support. Um, white Catholics, 63% support. Um, Hispanic Catholics, 67% support. So just to say this is not done because when you have one third who are opposed some extremely deeply, um, you cannot forget about that, but this is very, very significant support. And I think what happens and what has been happening is probably some real, but I also think some fabricated contestation around what a burden marriage is on other people. Um, and that contestation is what allows people to start poking and trying to build support for opposition that it's not, as we have said, and I think is shown is that marriage helps these families. It's not hurting anyone else. Uh, people keep trying to build a case about how marriage harms others. So yes, I think we're well on our way and, but I also know enough to never take anything for granted, even a win. Yeah, and of course, it always depends on how you ask those questions in these polls. And, you know, you can have people say that they support, but once you start to ask specific questions about bakers or religious schools and whatnot, you know, that's where we start to see more fault lines. And we'll get a little bit, um, we'll get back to the question around religious exemptions and what threats they pose to marriage equality going forward. Um, but I did want to now come back to the law. Um, you know, I had mentioned earlier about those dissents from Roberts, but particularly Alito, that in some ways laid out a roadmap um, for our opponents to try to undermine or overturn a burger fell. Um, what are you saying in terms of attempts to reverse this ruling? Well, we know that people talk openly about it, um, including at federal society conventions, at least there, you know, have been reports in the news about exactly this. Um, and we also have the 2020 GOP platform, which expressly calls for reversing Obergefell. But setting aside reversal for the moment, um, what we have seen is a continued attempt to try to drive a wedge between marriages of different sex couples and marriages of same sex couples um, on whatever basis people can find. And so, for example, there have been a number of cases and a bunch of them are still pending and we've been involved in many of them um, as a, usually as an amicus, um, bringing to bear what we've learned from all the marriage litigation and the DOMA litigation and Obergefell. But essentially, um, you know, some states 
or private employers have said, no, this pension doesn't apply to you. You can marry, but you don't get this protection. Um, yes, you can marry. Oh, okay, you've had people say, I can, I've married, but that doesn't mean I have to pay child support. Oh, yes, you do. Um, there's a case that's still running in Texas um, about the city of Houston and whether um, it should continue to provide um, spousal benefits for employees who are married to a person of the same sex. Um, these are all continuing cases and they all trigger that idea of like, is the same constellation of benefits available to same sex couples who are married and different sex couples who are married. And we say that's required. Um, so far we've won on that, but I also wanna just say that there's clearly a very concerted push on the parenting side and about who is a parent and the idea that the only way you can really both be parents is uh, as a married couple is if you're both genetic contributors to the child. So after Obergefell, there was a case out of Arkansas where, um, you know, these two, two different couples, um, female couples, they both had children. And normally upon birth, uh, there's a presumption that both parents are, well, both spouses are parents. And Arkansas contested that and said, no, because we know you're not the biological parent. Well, of course, what Arkansas overlooked um, and other states sometimes overlook is that under the law, there's a presumption that both people are parents. And it's one thing for the individual parties in the marriage to say, well, actually, no, you're not the parent this person is. But other people can't come in and challenge that based on what they think about who should be a parent. And there's a presumption, there's a very clear presumption in the law that's been in place for, hmm, I think, over 200 years that when you're married, the presumption is for stability's sake, for support of the child, that both of those spouses are parents. But there's an attempt here to use biology to say, not these people. And even this week, the state of Indiana, which is another state that had to get wrestled down on this issue, um, has filed a petition with the United States Supreme Court to try to relitigate that issue, even though in 2017, in this profound case from Arkansas, the Supreme Court said, that's not okay. And in that decision, there was um, a dissent by Justice Gorsuch um, saying a biology-based regime is different. Not that they had a biology-based regime, but that's how he chose to characterize it. So I think we're going to have to continue to, to press, push back on these. We're also seeing these emerge in the State Department context where there are cases where married same-sex couples have children abroad. Um, and one of the things that you want to be able to do is to have um, a child have your own citizenship. So if you have a married couple where one's a citizen and one is not, and they have a child, State Department has been saying, unless you're both biologically connected to the child, you can't um, confer your citizenship as a married couple. So we don't have those cases, but we have been aggressively supporting those cases, well, supporting the challenge to those, to that rule um, in litigation around the country, as have some other organizations uh, because that's another whole way where the federal government is really trying to create a dividing line as well. So more to say on that, but uh, we are very tuned to those issues. I think you're absolutely right that, you know, our opponent's use of biology to try to undermine our parental relationship is really troubling in the context of marriage. And it's even more troubling for those parents who choose not to marry. And then what happens to the security of those relationships. And I'll just kind of plug here that GLAD has been working deeply for many years and currently to ensure that all families and all parent-child relationships are protected regardless of whether the parents are married and regardless of the genetic relationship. And it's our attorney, Polly Crozier, who's really been leading a lot of the legislative reform across New England to ensure that our laws are updated and catch up to the reality of our families today. Um, but just coming back to the attack that we're seeing from the other side, um, one question that's on everyone's mind is what we're seeing in terms of attempts to expand religious exemptions. Um, what do you see as kind of the biggest threats in this arena? Well, I think we all know that we're all living this um, and that there, in fact, seems to be a very concerted attempt to redraw the boundaries of what constitutes free exercise of religion and what kinds of laws can be set aside. Um, we all had a skirmish, a very significant skirmish with this in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case um, from just a couple of years back, uh, where a baker who makes wedding cakes 
refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple because he didn't believe they could really enter into a marriage as he sees it. And although the court mostly ducked that issue, it did announce or really reaffirm a very important principle, which is that as a general matter, when you're out there in the marketplace, um, your individual beliefs about your customers or your faith, you know, don't allow you to turn people away. Um, that's what our anti-discrimination laws are about. And you have to bear in mind that we're talking about anti-discrimination laws, but history is rich with cases about um, whether employers can disregard tax laws or paying social security or comply with workplace safety. And um, there's a really, there's a lot implicated here in addition to anti-discrimination laws. Um, but I'd also have to say that, as I'm sure many of you know, there's another very important case coming um, also at the Supreme Court in this next term um, called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, which involves Catholic social services. And uh, with respect to the services that it provides for evaluating homes for, as, um, as potential foster homes and screening people, it refuses to do so for married same-sex couples. And I will just say that this case is interesting slash troubling because this is also um, this is a government service that they are contracted to do. You know, they're paid by taxpayers to do this. Um, there's a whole scheme about look at this, look at this. It's not about what do you personally believe. It's can you do these people meet these particular standards? Um, so this is actually an extremely far-reaching case, um, well beyond this particular context. Um, so that's that's coming up for review next year. Um, and then even right now, there are very important religion cases pending in the Supreme Court. Um, there's one, for example, about what they call the ministerial exception, which allows religious organizations to say who are their ministers. And when you say this person's a minister, there are no employment laws that apply to them. You can fire them for particularly awful discriminatory reasons if you want to. Um, and when the court announced this ruling, this, you know, accepted this framework in, in 2012, it did so in a very contextual, you know, multi-factor analysis. But the challenge now that's being pressed is, hey, as long as an employee has any religious function, shouldn't that be enough? Well, that's really broad. Uh, you know, if somebody is required to say a prayer once a day, does that make them a, a minister? Anyway, you get the point. Um, so that's out there pending. Um, beyond that, uh, there's also a case out of Montana about um, whether states can forbid aid to religious schools. And there's been a lot of activity on funding and governments being, whether governments are required to provide funding uh, to religious organizations. And that's gonna be an extremely consequential decision coming down this term. Uh, there's also um, the issue that the contraceptive mandate and the Affordable Care Act is back at the court in part because um, this administration um, issued a broad executive order that allows nonprofits, for profits to opt out of providing contraceptive care as required by the Affordable Care Act um, for religious and moral reasons. There is some fine tuning to go on in there, but suffice it to say, this is such a broad rule that clearly it would be harm to women who would not always have access to care. And is that constitutional? Um, and then finally, I wanna mention this. There's a case that went up, that's also about to be decided, called June Medical Services out of Louisiana. And that's a case involving a state law that's a lot like, like almost verbatim, um, a rule that was struck down out of Texas um, in 2016, I believe it was, in a case called Hellerstedt. And essentially what that required was, if you're an abortion provider, uh, you have to have admitting privileges in a nearby hospital. Of course, easier said than done, given what, um, given that not every hospital wants to provide admitting privileges for a doctor who um, facilitates uh, or performs abortions. Um, so there's no reason particularly that anybody can imagine why a court would have to revisit this issue other than it obviously got enough votes for reconsideration at the Supreme Court. And that also, of course, casts some concern about whether the court, this current court, simply wants to revisit precedents um, that it didn't like when Justice Kennedy was on the court. Definitely deeply concerning, um, particularly when it comes to our opponents' attempts to use religion to uh, roll back so many of the rights we fought so hard for in a variety of contexts. 
Um, in our last few minutes together, Mary, what do you see as some of the other critical work that we still need to do? Well, I do think that there's more work to do in the non-marital context, and you alluded to the parentage work. I also think there's work we could build out on that we've been involved in for years, actually, um, around trying to provide support for relationships as non-marital couples and families of choice. But I really want to talk for a moment about the Bostock decision from earlier this week, because we have to remember that we didn't get everything we wanted from any of the Supreme Court decisions that had been issued so far. We didn't get, you know, technically speaking, heightened scrutiny for LGBTQ um, characteristics being drawn into the law. Um, you know, there's lots of things still to go, but I want to say this Bostock decision is really important. Uh, because it really rejuvenates our efforts to challenge um, discrimination very, very broadly um, that exists already um, in lots of state and federal laws where we're just not included, but sex discrimination is included as a, as a, as a prohibited basis for treating people differently. Um, so we haven't won those cases. We still have to bring them, uh, but certainly we have a real leg up now. And I guess I also just need to say here that um, current administration, like almost from day one, has been very focused on trying to roll back protections and actually deepen discrimination against LGBTQ people um, in many, many ways. And really the foundation of it was sex is immutable, it's a biological binary, and there's no reason to respect um, LGBTQ people, no reason to respect trans people. They've gotten more and more extreme as the years have gone on. This boss not decision really knocked the legs out from under that. It doesn't mean we win everything that I think we should win, but boy, does it change uh, the context going forward. Thanks, and you know, there is certainly a lot of you know wind on our backs right now at a time when we really need it, and it's also been particularly inspiring to see, uh, again, the victory in the DACA decision today, um, the amazing work and protest of folks um, fighting for Black Lives Matter, um, and a host of other issues across um, that GLAD is proud to partner with and, and work for. Um, Mary, one last question. How are you going to be celebrating the fifth anniversary of Obergefell next week? Well, coincidentally, I will be on vacation, um, so that'll be nice. Good for you. And I, I just, and I need to, need to say one other quick thing, which is not really quick, but it is this, which is as we go forward, um, you know, we certainly seek equality, justice, dignity. And of course, I think the Constitution requires it. And at the same time, I also recognize that there are people who feel besieged by these rulings and these decisions. And while I'm not um, suggesting that we just cave in and give up and walk away far from it, I am suggesting that we um, continue to think through and build out what we've had as a really successful part of the American experiment which is having so many people um, of different faiths and so many people who are just different from one another generally coexist uh, and coexist in harmony um, with a rough accommodation of each other's interests. And I think that that work, um, that work has to continue um, as a way to have security for LGBTQ people and for everyone. Point well made. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you for all for joining today. Our next Justice Hangout will be on July 16th with Senior Attorney and AIDS Law Project Director Ben Klein. It's entitled, What Stigma Got to Do With It? The Ongoing Fight Against Anti-Gay, Anti-Trans, and HIV-Related Bias. And then in August, Legal Director Gary Buzik will talk about the Fulton case that Mary just mentioned. You can always visit us on our website at glad.org to learn more. And a reminder that you can contact gladanswers.org if you're experiencing discrimination in any context or need legal information or help. Thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you particularly to our GLAD supporters who make this work possible. We are so proud to partner with you in all of our work. Take care and have a wonderful weekend.